Hi, I'm Jason Gorber from ThatShelf.com and we're here to do a little bit of celebration of Miles Davis. Big change. So today would have been Miles Davis's, I guess, his 95th birthday. Um, one of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century, an incredibly complicated guy. Um, uh, you start sort of scratching the surface of any of these quote-unquote creative geniuses. Occasionally you run into uh, some trouble trying to uh, adjudicate them as human beings. But as an artist, just um, truly one of the great masters of the 20th or any century, frankly. Um, not only did he change music once, he changed music multiple times. Um, he, was, he was fundamentally somebody that could not only recognize um, prevailing trends, but help shape them and reshape them be incredibly experimental right to the end, um, make many failures and many astonishing leaps. Um, anybody with that kind of mind, um, that sort of openness, a very jealous musician in some of the best ways. He would hear something and realize that he wanted to have a part of that and find a different way. Um, and surrounded himself with incredibly hungry, incredibly gifted musicians um, at a time where you needed to both have incredible groove and incredible mathematical sophistication. It's a really interesting time in music history where absolute virtuosic um, complexity was required simultaneous with feel. And, and, and it's the collision of those two seemingly disparate elements, the sort of naturalism of, 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 of feeling the groove and, and, and everything that sort of takes place is sort of so-called just, you know, it comes to the, the gifted musician just by themselves and the incredible sophisticated, um, academic precision of uh, the post-pop era, of 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 um, um, of all the elements, right through modal, right through um, fusion, um, hell, even his complete and ridiculous uh, forays into um, uh, nascent hip hop, still have moments that are just absolutely breathtaking. If all you do is judge him by those who he surrounded himself with, if all you do is look at the various quintets he had, the bands he assembled, the just the the family tree of just absolute astonishing geniuses that sort of surround Miles Davis. Um, everybody that came that he came out of and that came out of um, his bands, you essentially have from the from everybody from um, um, the nineteen twenties right through the present day. This absolute sort of um, family tree, either uh, uh, what he was following upon and the lessons that he uh, preceded. Just astonishing. And for so many people, um, they're sort of gateway into everything that Miles, the, <laughs> the giant um, catalog that he had um, of, of recordings, comes to the sort of middle period. After he'd, again, helped completely reshape music with stuff like Birth of Cool, um, um, the, the, the early uh, recordings that he did um, on Prestige, into his Columbia recording. Um, he and Bill Evans, again, <laughs> a giant, um, and, and this, this remarkable uh, group of musicians uh, came together and, you know, changed jazz yet again with the incredibly modal, incredibly beautiful Kind of Blue. Uh, kind of Blue, in its um, relatively brief running time, is, is so transformative, so incredibly impactful. It truly is one of those absolute Mount Rushmore moments. Um, and, and in some ways, some of the people Mount Rushmore don't necessarily need to be Mount Rushmore. But if we are going to use this American metaphor, we might as well use it for something like this. Um, and, and it's Talmudic in its, in its uh, import. Just absolutely breathtakingly amazing. Um, I knew um, in university, I knew somebody that had done their entire thesis on nothing but the So What uh, solo. Um, uh, the mouse solo, little, little cannibals or, or Coltrane's, uh, Paul Chambers bass, uh, notes at the beginning, it just, just stupid amounts of excellence in this, in this record. And it's incredibly listenable. Um, it's, it's, it's accessible. It's beautiful. It's melodic. It's warm. You can put it in and just think this is a jazz record that I like. And then you, the deeper you dive, the more you, it revels in this artistry, the more you recognize how the 
um, sort of uh, sticking in the tutorial and doing all the nonsense um, that takes place uh, musicologically just serves the song, just serves the performance. Um, there, there's quotes to, to contemporary uh, R&B in some of the solos, but there's quotes to really deep, heavy bop, all sort of um, showcasing this incredibly yeah, melodic moment. It, it, it is a time when, I, when, when you know that every note was chosen by people that knew what the hell they were playing. Um, very famously, there's a crash cymbal lead in to um, Miles' solo. Uh, uh, that's this amazing shimmer. And it's just, it's just one tiny moment, um, that, that just, <laughs> just, it just feels like you're entering a new world. It just feels that if that's all you're going to hold on to, you're going to get something truly extraordinary to kind of blue. Now, of course, when it comes to collecting music and actually, um, listening to music, this is one of those records that sort of checks off all the boxes. First of all, it's a masterpiece. Second of all, it sounds amazing. The, uh, the recording itself done at Columbia Studios in New York, I guess 30th Street Studios, is just stunning. Um, all done basically single takes. They just got in there, they recorded, it was done. Mixed in real time. Um, recorded on three track, which was kind of interesting. They sort of um, split it up. Two recording dates. And um, the three track allowed them to sort of mixed down to either stereo or mono. There's two different uh, mixes. But it also allowed um, a little bit of surround nonsense. So I'm actually going to start with something that's probably going to, you know, not necessarily be the favorite of many people who actually are into collecting vinyl, but I'm going to give a shout out to what Sony did um, for me to truly open up this record, for me to really, like, I love this record, but to fall in love desperately with this record is actually this. Now, this is the Super Audio CD of Kind of Blue. This came out when Sony and Warner were fighting over music formats. Warner and their associated music were going on a DVD audio route. This was Super Audio CD. Picture the HD DVD Blu-ray nonsense, except neither one, basically. I mean, there's kind of still very, 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 very few DVD audios that come out and, and, and definitely a few more SACDs. Um, for the high-end audio file market. But nonetheless, this is a multi-channel Super Audio CD, a 5.0 mix. And what they did is they took those three channels and they basically laid it out in, in the surround field so that you're getting the three tracks that are recorded. Because they're all recorded in one room, there's so much bleed going on, you basically have full isolation. And because of the way it was recording, there's so much beautiful ambience actually in this sort of crazy church thing that they recorded in, you actually get a lot of that um, uh, sound coming in the back channels. So it's a very effective, beautiful, warm, non-fussed with version of what's on those three channel tapes. And I really, really recommend anybody who loves this record half as much as I do to find a way to genuinely take a listen to um, the Super Audio CD multi-channel. I know so many people that hate surround mixes, that thinks it's, um, uh, it lacks a form of purity, that, you know, uh, poo-poo all digital stuff. Sony spent a fortune on this to try to actually make it. This is like what, when, when, when I have um, Sony's version of uh, Lawrence of Arabia on 4K. This is their audio equivalent of finding something that is the absolute touchstone of their catalog no expenses spared to get the best possible um, presentation to showcase a format that in the end nobody else gave a damn about. Most people who are listening to surround sound are doing so on home theater equipment that don't necessarily um, rise to the uh, the level of um, many people's two-channel audio file equipment. I'm one of those lunatics that actually has spent more money on my rear speakers than I have on my side speakers and I have a switch box to allow me to have my rears fill out the 5.0 sound so with 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 this setup matching timbrely with what i have going on the front i have a center channel that is full range that allows me to actually experience this the way that the mixers experience it and it's a truly truly phenomenal thing um there's been a couple other major releases of it um one that i picked up not that long ago was this this is the blue note 50th um version of kind of blue. I bought it, you know, I didn't need it. Whoever needs uh, more and more stuff. But this was a really lovely hardcover book with a whole bunch of fantastic 
photos and elements and all kinds of stuff from the recording studio. From my understanding, they only shot um, photos during the second day of recording. Nonetheless, lots to actually love here. Um, original notes, all kinds of stuff, talking about the actual elements um, that actually uh, sort of came, came together. It's all put together uh, by Ashley Kahn, who... Um, is sort of the the expert on all things kind of blue and um really um e extraordinary presentation inside um the reproduction sort of the 12 inch uh vinyl sized um uh presentation you have the gatefold I'll try to do this carefully inside the gatefold you have a number of discs one of these discs is the Celebrating Masterpiece Kind of Blue uh, uh, DVD, which, you know, is an okay documentary. Then you have on CD, if I can get this out, I hate these labels, you have this. The Kind of Blue with a reproduction of the Columbia Six Eye. And then you have the other disc, which I believe, if I'm not crazy, one's stereo, one's mono. It's been so long since I pulled this out, but nonetheless. The, the second disc, CD1 and CD2. I, I lied, excuse me. Um, CD1 has the, um, um, uh, uh, ridiculous. I have, um, CD1 is the full album and then a bunch of studio sequences that they actually assemble the, um, the sort of chats in between. And CD2 is um, um, uh, 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 alternate takes, um, a 17 minute alternate take of So What. Really should dig this out. It's been so long since I've listened to it. What I did listen to, that came with, is you get the blue version of Kind of Blue. So, you know, why not? This is the, um, again, the sort of anniversary version, the stereo version on blue vinyl, because it looks nice. Some fun for Kind of Blue. Now, for those of us, oh, you got a nice little um, booklet at the back. And some more fun. We get this poster. This is really lovely. Of three shots of miles in the studio. And then some more Chechkas. Who doesn't love Chechkas? <laughs> we have the original sticker. This is nice. I actually bought this used, but the person actually kept the sort of front sticker. Definitely something I respect. Something I do all the time. We have the Genius of Miles box set, the Miles Davison group, another book with elements about it, and a bunch of wonderful photographs. I really should probably frame these, but a series of photographs of there, Miles, I mean this, Miles in front of a telefunken, what's not to love, Miles. There we are, Paul, Paul Chambers, Gil Evans, and Miles Davis, thinking hard, <laughs> deciding how to actually voice this stuff. Just amazing stuff. This Coltrane kid went on to do some pretty amazing stuff. Um, we even have here um, uh, uh, a reproduction of letters written at the time by Bill Evans discussing the actual recording. Pretty wild stuff. Um, uh, uh, amazing sort of tribute to this record um, that was done sort of as a box set, a straight up, uh, straight ahead box set. Um, the recording is um, good. The pressing's okay. Um, I listened to it, but again, sort of my go-to. Frankly, I bought it mostly for the stuff. Why not? And uh, a chance to actually have you know, not yet another recording of this incredible masterpiece. Now, uh, in terms of the two channel, what I thought that I would probably end up for the rest of my days, um, Mobile Fidelity has done actually a pretty excellent job with most of the Miles Davis catalog. Um, I have some fantastic 45 RPM versions of a bunch of the records, and they did this. So this is the Mobile Fidelity limited edition box set of kind of blue minus limited edition minus special limited edition number 11,905 um originally released in 2015 i got mine not that long ago i think they just did a very last um um run on these 
um, because of something that's coming out. Uh, nonetheless, there is their 45 uh, RPM version. Inside, naturally, we have the record on, um, on Mofi's label. 45 RPM, lots of space here. Spread out the grooves, make the bass sound a lot better. And uh, doing what Mofi always does, which is their own sort of version of this, the box itself. They don't actually recreate the entire um, uh, outer cover on the inside. They sort of do a paper version of this with the original master recording. Now, what original master recording was this? That's where the uh, debate comes up all the time. There's obviously two discs in here and uh, some cardboard to actually hold it out. So what did they use to do this? Now, we talked about that there's original um, three channel, uh, tape that, uh, was, is the original master. There's actually, it gets a little bit complicated and there's a whole video, another video that we could actually spend on this, but basically it was recorded the three channel. There was, um, a master recorder and a safety. One of the master recorders, um, the speed, um, was slightly off. It was obviously unintentional because the other one wasn't foot width. And normally if they're ever doing any recordings that are actually adjusting the speed, like Sergeant, uh, like, um, any of the stuff on, um, Strawberry Fields Forever, for example, that's done after the fact they record it and then do other takes with it. So it certainly wouldn't be done at the time of recording. Nonetheless, um, what uh, a lot of mixes have been done have been um, this, uh, for example, is done straight from the um, uh, in the digital domain, straight from the three channel master. Supposedly, what they used was a two channel master tape produced by Sony for use for this. But the actual tapes themselves, the actual three channel, did not go out to do this. This is what we are told and what we understand. Mobile Fidelity. Um, does extraordinary jobs mastering their stuff. I really love what they do, but they certainly like every mastering on <laughs> almost every mastering. There's a little bit of futzing, a um, little bit of bass tweaking, a little bit of treble um, futzing to make it sound like what it was originally meant to sound like at the time, usually, or to make to do some sweetening, frankly. Um, again, there's an entire other discussion to have about whether or not we as consumers were meant to hear the master tapes, particularly from stuff um, recorded back in the day, because master tapes were inevitably going to go through another process. It's like seeing an uncolored timed um, negative. We were never supposed to see that as film goers. Uh, it was always going to be timed at the release print and you were always shooting stuff. Or if you have wires like in Wizard of Oz, um, those wires would be sort of covered up by the printing process that when you have the negative and then the inner positive and the positive, you would lose some of that detail. Things would soften and some things that look like mistakes, if you see it in the sh <laughs> like spotlight of digital, um, weren't necessarily going to be seen in the sort of more analog medium. That being said, you don't want to bake in problems. You don't want to make things sound like compressed or for, you know, so it sounds good on Spotify or something like this. This is still very much an audio file release, but nonetheless, um, some people are not, um, super, super, uh, pleased with some of the choices. I think it sounds great. And I really look forward to, uh, owning this for many years to come as a version an iteration, a interpretation, if you were of, of the two channel mix that, um, uh, they actually got from, uh, access from Sony Columbia in order to use the mobile fidelity. Um, which leads us to, uh, this guy from our friends at, uh, acoustic sounds. Now this is a total tease for me because, um, while I ordered the UHQR, uh, I waited a couple days cause I thought a couple things. One, I knew I was going to get the 45 RPM, which had been announced at the same time. I'm like apples to apples. And look, everybody knows that the last year record buying has gone nuts. Everybody's gone nuts. People are buying digital baseball cards or basketball cards or whatever, and people going crazy for it. In other words, it's not just about collecting music anymore. It's not just about listening to music. There's an entire thing that's happened during COVID of people being home and many, many more people being come in obsessive about records, which is great, but many, many people buying it to flip, which is not so great. It's a whole thing. So I waited a couple days because shipping's a fortune. I finally convinced a couple of friends to go in on it and I bought it, but I'm in the second round. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm not getting my UHQR, um, miles. I'm actually hoping to borrow from, um, 
uh, uh, somebody um, to actually do sort of a full look at that. But I want to sort of give you the lead up to what. Now, the UHQR um, Acoustic Sounds, Analog Productions, but um, have 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 taken the classic records um, uh, plates, the stuff that Bernie Grumman did in the late '90s, and released on classic records. But it's going to be pressed on their fancy new UHQR vinyl, which is great. Um, those of you who watched my um, uh, video on Aqualung, please do. You can see the uh, behind me. It's a beautiful set with a wood dowel. It's extremely exciting. I thought I'm not going to order both the 33 and 45. Well, of course I did. I'm an idiot. And if I would have done it a couple days earlier, it would have been here already. But what I did do um, was I decided to actually pick up the mono finally, and that's what's in this box. So this is this is you know almost like. Is that now? This was not supposed to be sent to me. This was supposed to be sent when my other mouses came, which you know won't be for a couple weeks or a couple months. They've, they've sold out twenty-five thousand copies, which is totally insane. But um, nonetheless, this was the idea um, that I would get this. As you can see, I fight on this stuff all the time. So what did I get in here? In this crazy packaging, I got. Yet another kind of blue. This is the CL1355 guaranteed high fidelity pressing in beautiful mono. Now, we know it was recorded in three channel. We know that three channel has made five channel and has made two channel. This will be the mono mix. This is a dedicated mono mix. This is not just a fold down. I have a phono preamp. I can hit the mono button if that's what I wanted to. But they actually mix this specifically for monophonic and i have never heard this <laughs> and i am really excited to hear it in a different way what you get with mono for those that are unaware um is this um uh instead of things being spread out you actually get this front and back thing especially if your setup is great or you have really good headphones and you you get this interleaving of instrumentation um that, that think of uh, EQing for mono as you're basically sort of um, um, creating these uh, sort of areas that you can block out so that the sound can sort of exist. It's a very different experience. Um, and sometimes it can be extremely thrilling. You actually get this incredible timbral integration between very similar um, instrumentation or this really wide stuff where stuff feels like it's in your lap and some stuff feels very far away. So it's a really fascinating psychoacoustic thing that happens when playing mono on a duophonic system. And now those two speakers, mono signal, the image should be dead center in front of you, but sort of come in and out based on the mixing and how the instrumentation works. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, good sticker to have, uh, pressed at RTI. So the the um, the sort of the other uh, giant American um, uh, audiophile pressing plant. Um, this is essentially the record store day release. Um, uh, Kevin Gray, uh, I believe, um, uh, did the plating on this. Another, uh, it's ridiculous. A few years ago, I would not have been able to name um, the the mastering engineers, the people actually uh, press, uh, um, actually convert the audio stuff to a thing that it, then records are made from. But nonetheless, here we are. Here we are. Um, this is was released originally in, in um, 2013 Record Store Day when I was not buying this stuff. It was sort of in my dip. Um, and then they re-released it. Now, because of the lunacy of the UHQR, even this copy was getting incredibly hard to get. And our friends at um, uh, Acoustic Sounds actually got a couple copies in. I was unable to find this anywhere in Canada. Um, and so I said, yeah, stick this in with my other Miles order and then I'll have two Miles to listen to. Well, they accidentally sent it to me um, um, without waiting. I think they're having a little issue um, figuring out all the stuff in the shipping. You know, they got a lot going out. So nonetheless, this is what I have to look forward to. This is what I'm gonna listen tonight um, to celebrate uh, Miles' birthday. Um, look, I think whomever you are, whatever you listen to, I don't care if you listen to crazy contemporary pop or you know 12th century choral music this is one of the great accomplishments of human history how's that for hyperbole kind of blue really is that greatest of the great it 
is something that is both popular and spectacular. And I think it's really easy for people to dismiss how spectacular this record is because of its popularity, because of how common it is, as it were. Um, I, I, we've, we've seen a lot of that happen. I'm like, oh, Citizen Game's not that good. Whatever. Kind of Blue really is magnificent. And whomever you are, whatever you are, whatever you're doing, take some time today, tomorrow, whatever day. Just throw it on. Listen to it as a full experience. Listen to it from start to finish. Not while you're doing other stuff, but listen to it. Put yourself into that room in New York. Put yourself as, in the room as these musical legends are coming up with this improvised music on the spot, rewriting history, rewriting music, and doing things that to this day just absolutely uh, give chills. For ThatShelf.com, I'm Jason Gorber. Happy birthday, Miles. Um, uh, we will see you next video. Thanks so much and happy listening. Take care.